Hi there, greetings and welcome to another video on surgical discussion. This video has been created keeping especially you in mind. You can listen to the audio while driving or else you can even listen to the audio on your device or mobile phone. Alternatively, if you can watch the slides, they will complement your understanding of the subject. I have asked questions to promote analytical thinking. I have even answered those questions so that you can get yourself practically oriented. Okay, let's presume that you are in the OR and you are going to perform a lap coli. A question has been asked to you. Is this a contracted gallbladder? Number two, what is the size of the stone? And number three, what is the size of the clip applicator that you require? Now you will be really wondering how to measure the gallbladder size, the cystic duct size and also the stone size just by looking at it on the monitor. How can you do so? Very simple. The first thing that you need to do is that you need to measure your Maryland jaw. Most people don't know this but it's a surgical fact that the Maryland jaw is usually 1.7 centimeters in length. Surgical fact number two is that if you open the jaws of your Maryland it will form an equilateral triangle. Number three this is a less known fact that you have almost about 15 serrations per centimeter in your jaw. So if you would like to use a rule of thumb you can state that every five serrations is equivalent to three millimeter. So if you want to gauge the size of the cystic duct just get your Maryland close by to the cystic duct magnify the whole thing and you can see how many serrations you have that will give you a rough idea as to how many millimeter is the size of the cystic duct. Take a clip three times that size and that's it. You can even use the open jaws to measure the gallbladder length. That will give you an idea whether this is a contracted gallbladder or a normal size gallbladder. You can even use this to measure the stone. It becomes important because the incisions that you make on the patient are usually about 12 mm to accommodate your 10 or 12 mm port. So if your trocar goes in by 12 mm and your stone is 3 centimeters, you can't expect your skin and your fascia to stretch so much. So it's always better to go ahead and measure your tissues because at one point of time you will need to know whether you need to crush the stone or if the stone can come out without you doing any other surgical maneuver. Now the histological plan of the gallbladder. All of the GIT is made up of four layers. The mucosa which contains the epithelium, the basement membrane and the lamina propria. The submucosa which mainly contains collagen, elastin, blood vessels and lymphatics. Not to forget the nerves. The muscularis which contains inner circular and outer longitudinal and finally the serosa. The gallbladder is different because it has the same mucosal layer as any other part of the GIT but mainly it is missing the muscularis mucosae. The second layer with the submucosa is absent in the gallbladder. Therefore the gallbladder has a mucosa which is directly plastered to the serosa but in between you have the crisscross arrangement of muscle fiber. Now this reticular network or a reticular means a net. This reticular network of arrangement of muscles is mainly seen in the fundus. As you go to the body and the infundibulum, it is mainly elastic fibers. So between these crisscross diamond shaped spaces, there is the mucosa directly getting plastered onto the serosa. Now when the gallbladder distends, the whole of the thing distends, the propulsive action is by the fundus, whereas the distension occurs in the body. There are certain diamond shaped spaces which lead to diverticulae which are called as Ashoff rocketensis kinesis. In the presence of bacteria 
the cholesterol and the fat globules which are usually lying in these sinuses can change their chemical structure because the bacterium usually secrete gluconeolase. Now these will unconjugate the bilirubin and also the fats and also the phospholipids. The most important phospholipid here is lecithin which becomes lysolecithin. This has a soap like effect acting on the mucosa directly and causing a sloughing of the mucosal cells by getting washed away. Now these bacterial toxins can directly act on the submucosa and subserosa to spread the infection into the wall which causes empyema, emphysema, perforation of the gallbladder only because of the simple arrangement of anatomy. If supposing there is no infection, there is a deposition of cholesterol crystals and fat globules in the sinuses and this explains the strawberry gallbladder. If there is too much of inflammation of the mucosa and some degree of cholesterol getting trapped inside this mucosa, this forms adenomyomatosis or polyps. So this gives you a clear picture of how the histology can reflect in your pathology or your histopathology report. Observe these two pictures. The one on your left is an opened up gallbladder and you can see the mucosa is looking almost like a strawberry and this represents a strawberry gallbladder. To your right is a diagram representing the portal triad, the gallbladder and the cholecystohepatic triangle. On a CT scan and ultrasound one needs to orient how exactly the portal triad looks like. It's simple to understand that the portal vein is the posterior most structure. Anterior to that, there are two structures, one medial and one lateral. The blood vessels are always medial and the bile ducts are always lateral. Observe now the cholecystohepatic triangle. You will see that the cystic artery is a direct branch of the right hepatic artery. In 20% of cases, when you open the cholecystohepatic triangle, the only blood vessel there that is found is the right branch of the hepatic artery. So inadvertent clipping of that artery will lead to an ischemic necrosis of the right half of the liver. I shall explain a few practical points in future slides. The gallbladder is a pear shaped sac 7 to 10 centimeters in length and having a capacity of 30 to 50 ml. If it gets distended, it can become up to 300 ml in capacity. One needs to deflate the gallbladder if it's overinflated during the lap coli so that it can facilitate an easy grasp. If it constantly slips, the liver also falls down with it and the anatomy of the caro triangle gets distorted. One also needs to understand that the gallbladder is pear shaped. So if you see that the gallbladder is looking shrunken, contracted, having multiple gallstones and it is thick on palpation, it may be a good decision to do an incidental cholecystectomy if you are in a laparotomy field. Now the gallbladder has multiple parts, the fundus which is rounded having mainly smooth muscles, the body and the infundibulum which have collagen and elastin fibers which are continuous with the muscle. The neck is the narrowest part with gen which then joins the cystic duct. At times the Hartman's pouch is found at the infundibulum and the neck junction. It is a pathological finding. Physiological and normal gallbladders don't have a Hartman's pouch. That Hartman's pouch is caused when stones get impacted in this area. The target during operation is the neck of the gallbladder where one starts to, to dissect off the peritoneum, to tease off the peritoneum and skeletonize the cystic duct starting from above downwards. The gallbladder is plastered to its fossa on the inferior hepatic surface and a line from this fossa to the IVC divides the liver into right and left lobes. This can be used as a guideline while reading a CT scan film to divide the liver into right and left. In addition to that, the hepatic veins, three of them, divide the liver into different areas. 
and you can draw another line which is transverse thus dividing the liver into eight different lobes. So both these points can be used while reading a CT scan to actually assess the area of extent or the area of damage or the extent of damage. The peritoneum that covers the liver is continuous over the gallbladder. Sometimes you can find anomalies like a floating gallbladder having a mesentery of peritoneum or else even an intrahepatic gallbladder which is partially embedded into the liver. When one encounters an intrahepatic gallbladder it is safer to use the critical view during laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The meaning of the critical view is that you dissect off the peritoneum from the neck of the gallbladder downwards and also dis dissect the lateral and the medial leaf peritoneum which are on either sides of the gallbladder so that you can see between the cystic duct and not the liver bed but a free space or a free window you would be able to see the structures that are to be divided which are basically the cystic duct and the cystic artery so this makes it safe during your gallbladder surgery Second of all, in 90% of cases, the cystic artery is a direct branch of the right hepatic artery. It is found in the callous triangle. The cystic artery divides into an anterior and posterior branch at the level of the lymph node of Lund, which is present very close by to the junction of infundibulum and neck. The venous drainage of the gallbladder goes directly into the liver. Therefore, any infection of the gallbladder directly can drain into the liver through the hematogenous route and the infection of the bile can be transmitted by the lymphatics to the liver and also direct connection of the bile itself can cause cholangitis. So this is the reason that one should be very careful while dealing with the case of acute cholecystitis. The nerve supply sympathetic and parasympathetic sympathetic supply the gallbladder and as far as pain is concerned T8 and T9 is the sympathetic level and therefore this explains the Boyce's sign. These diagrams represent the anomalous anatomy of the vasculature of the gallbladder. Usually the gallbladder is to be supplied by the cystic artery but remember that not all your cystic arteries read anatomy books. It could also happen that the cystic artery is a direct branch of the right hepatic. The right hepatic is very close by to the gallbladder. The right hepatic could be the only artery in the cholecystohepatic triangle or sometimes the cystic artery could come somewhere between the confluence of the right and left hepatic arteries. Rare situations that the cystic artery is a direct branch of the left hepatic artery. The practical point is that when you are doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy you need to clip the cystic artery because if it doesn't bleed the problem is solved. Supposing you are thinking that there is an anomaly which can happen in 20% of cases wherein the right hepatic artery is the only vessel in the cholecystohepatic triangle, skeletonize the artery and grip it gently with your medial and forceps. If you see the liver changing color, you know that you are dealing with a right hepatic artery. So what do you do to solve the problem? Dissect very close to the gallbladder and usually you will find the cystic artery branch coming out from there. Clip it carefully and that's it. The second picture shown here is one of a subtotal cholecystectomy. Questions have also been asked whether this is a good approach for a patient who is having a chronic shrunken difficult gallbladder to handle also when you are doing a fundus first approach. The answer is simple if a subtotal cholecystectomy has been done properly then your problem is solved. The steps while doing a subtotal cholecystectomy are Dissect off the gallbladder using a fundus first method coming nearby to the junction of probably the infundibulum or the cystic duct or the CBD. When one is there avoid damage to the CBD and take off the gallbladder over suing the infundibulum and cystic duct from the inside to prevent a bile leak and also completely cauterizing and 
fulgurating the mucosa prior to putting a ligature. The amount of dissection that happens in this place is good enough to disrupt the blood supply of the gallbladder. Second of all, remember the chronic fibrosis that we talked about in the histological plan. We'll see to it that the small blood vessels are completely destroyed. So if you take off the mucosa, the problem is solved. Another approach called the Lilly's method exists where you do a subtotal cholecystectomy and the portion of the gallbladder which lies on the fossa is left there and all that you do is cauterize the mucosa. Remember this, no mucosa, no problem. If the subtotal cholecystectomy is done well, there is no more pouch and you will never have recurrent stones there. Whereas if a very poor subtotal cholecystectomy is done, there is a chance that there could be stones in the stump of the gallbladder and you can present with a new gallbladder. Which means to say that the primary problem was solved only partially and it recurs again. You might be wondering to yourself where is the exact spot to do a subtotal cholecystectomy. Answer is simple. It's the lymph node of Lund level. This lymph node is also known as the lymph node of Muscagny. This serves as a guide during operative surgery because it marks the splitting of the vessel into an anterior and posterior branch. It also marks a site where the cystic artery dips into the serosa. This lymph node is usually glassy in appearance and sometimes it could be a little turbid in appearance. So when the vessel dips into the serosa and into the musculature or the elastin fibers, that's where too much of fibrosis could cause the vessels to constrict leading to poor blood supply, ischemia and one cause of acute inflammations. So use this as a good marker during your lab colies. It may also occur that when you see a lymph node of Lund, you may get tempted or overzealous to do a dissection around the place. Remember that the lymph node is usually packed with fibrosis. Therefore, too much of traction or dissection could actually avulse the vessel from there. So respect the lymph node and be a little gentle when you are doing your dissection in that area. The right and the left hepatic ducts join together to form the common hepatic duct which is joined by the cystic duct to form the CBD. The CBD is one which is gauged during an ultrasound scan or during any other imaging investigation. It is usually 6 mm in diameter up to the age of 50. After the age of 50, for every 10 years, you can add 1 mm to its diameter. Also bear in mind that after laparoscopic cholecystectomy or even after cholecystectomy, the CBD size usually increases. So it is normal to have a mild distension of the CBD after cholecystectomy and one shouldn't usually get alarmed. There are many variations of the cystic duct joining the CBD and one needs to be careful while doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy that there is no injury to the CBD and that's the most important important thing. Remember that during the lap coli you are taking off the gallbladder and you are shutting off its blood supply as long as there is no bleeding, no damage to the bile ducts and no bile leak, everything is cool. If there is any suspicion about the anatomy, you can always get an intraoperative cholangiogram. It is not a routine in every case but it can be done when one suspects something is amiss. Just for the sake of mentioning it, the CBD and the pancreatic duct union. 70% of the time, the ducts unite outside the duodenal wall. They join together in the duodenum as a single duct. 10% of the time, they are separate openings in the, into the duodenum. Whereas 20% of the time, they join inside the duodenal wall and either they have no common duct or a very short duct. Practically, when one attends an ERCP, you will see the patient either in the prone or in the left lateral decubitus position. The union of these ducts doesn't make any difference. The only thing one needs to remember is that when the sphincterotome is inside the sphincter of OD, you need to make a cut exactly at the 11 o'clock position. And everything is cool because you are not damaging anything else other than the sphincter 
which is cut exactly in line with the CBD. The gastroduodenal and the right hepatic arteries give off two branches called the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock arteries which are on the medial and the lateral side of the CBD. These arteries anastomose freely within the duct walls and are responsible for the vascularity of the CBD. Thus any incision which is made transverse on the CBD destroys these arteries and causes fibrosis as a consequence leading to strictures. A safe incision on the CBD is the one which is made vertically. This prevents injury to the vasculature and thus preserves its vascularity preventing fibrosis in the future. There is a stark difference between bile production and bile secretion. Bile production is the function of the liver which produces almost half a litre to 1200 ml of bile per day whereas bile secretion is the function of the gallbladder and the extrahepatic biliary tree. Vagal stimulation increases the secretion of bile whereas stimulation of the splanchnic nerves results in decreased secretion of bile. When the duodenum has hydrochloric acid, proteins or fats, there is a stimulation to the release of secretin from the duodenum. This increases both the production and the secretion of bile. What exactly is bile composed of? It is composed of water and electrolytes which is isoelectric with the plasma. Sodium, potassium, calcium and chlorine have the same concentrations in the plasma and the bile. Bile is composed of lipids that is cholesterol and phospholipids which lend the bile a golden color. Bile also has proteins and the most important component of bile are the bile salts and bile pigments. The bile salts are cholate and chenodeoxycholate which are synthesized from cholesterol. When cholate and chenodeoxycholate are conjugated either with taurine and glycine, these become the bile acids. The bile salts are excreted into the bile from the hepatocyte and they help in the absorption and the digestion of fats. Once inside the intestines, 80% of the conjugated bile acids are absorbed in the terminal ileum. 20% is then deconjugated by the gut bacteria forming the secondary bile acids that is deoxycholate and lithocholate. These are absorbed by the colon, transported into the liver, conjugated and secreted in the bile again. 95% of the bile acid pool is reabsorbed by the enterohepatic circulation and 5% is excreted in the stools. The gallbladder and the sphincter of OD together are responsible for the dynamics of the secretion of the bile. Regarding the functions of the gallbladder, first of all it is useful for absorption of the bile and it concentrates the bile 10 times its original concentration. Secondly, the gallbladder mucosa secretes actively hydrogen ions and glycoproteins. The glycoproteins are the mucus which protect the bile mucosa and also lubricate the bile when it gets excreted. The hydrogen ions maintain an acidic pH so that the calcium doesn't precipitate in the bile. In the likely event of there being an impacted stone in the Hartman's pouch, the bile gets completely absorbed and what happens to the gallbladder is a high drops which is full of white bile. Regarding the motor activity of the gallbladder, it is in function with the sphincter of OD. When the sphincter of OD is contracted, there is a pressure gradient created in the gallbladder. During fasting and the phase 2 of the interdigestive migrating myoenteric motor complex, 
the gallbladder repeatedly empties small volumes into the duodenum. When one starts eating the food and there is a change of pH and volume in the stomach and the duodenum, the duodenum starts secreting CCK from the duodenal mucosa. It has a half-life of 2 to 3 minutes and it acts directly on the mucosa and the muscles of the gallbladder. The gallbladder starts actively secreting the bile for 30 to 40 minutes and later slowly the gallbladder starts relaxing for another 90 minutes. So this regulates the flow of bile from the gallbladder with a synchronous relaxation of the sphincter of OD. Later on, within about 40 minutes, the gallbladder slowly starts relaxing to accept more bile into the system. This is how the neurohormonal regulation of the bile flow occurs in the gallbladder. The sphincter of OD is a circular or a circumferential muscular layer which is almost about 4 to 6 millimeters in length and it has a basal resting pressure of about 13 to 15 millimeter above the duodenal pressure. The sphincter shows phasic contractions. It contracts once every 15 seconds to an amplitude of anywhere between 12 to 140 millimeters of mercury. The sphincter of OD works along with the gallbladder so that both of them function. The sphincter relaxes when the gallbladder contracts. As was discussed earlier, the gallbladder contracts in response to cholecystokinin. Vasoactive intestinal polypeptide inhibits the contraction and causes relaxation of the gallbladder. Somatostatin and its analogues do the same. They prevent the contraction of the gallbladder. Therefore, patients who are having VIP secreting tumors or somatostatin secreting tumors have an increased incident of gallstones because of this physiological reason. The usual lab investigations done for gallbladder and biliary disease start with the CBC. If the WBC is elevated, one gets an indication that either there is an infection due to cholecystitis which is acute or cholangitis. If supposing there is elevation of the total bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, then one should even suspect cholangitis. When the aminotransferases are elevated, one should look at whether there is an AST or ALT rise or both of them. ALT is a mitochondrial enzyme and it indicates severe liver damage whereas AST is a cytosolic liver enzyme which indicates a mild liver damage. As one understands, damage to the mitochondrium means that now the cell is irreversibly damaged. If there is only a biliary colic or chronic cholecystitis, blood tests are usually normal. Ultrasound is an excellent investigation for the gallbladder and the extrahepatic biliary tree. It is non-invasive, painless and there is no radiation. It can be repeatedly performed and especially can be done on the critically ill patients. In the case of obese patients, those with ascites and those having intestinal obstruction and distended bowel, the ultrasound examination is less satisfactory. Ultrasound is 90% specific and sensitive for gallbladder stones. It is definitely better than CT scan as far as stones are concerned. When one sees the stone in the gallbladder, two things confirm it. First of all, the stone reflects the sound wave and second of all, there is a posterior acoustic shadowing. Thirdly, stones are mobile, usually, whereas polyps, if they are calcified, are not mobile. This is how one differentiates between a polyp and a stone. In acute cholecystitis, 
there is a thickening of the gallbladder because of edema and there is also pericholecystic fluid. Both of these point towards acute cholecystitis. And if there are stones in the gallbladder, one knows that the cause of cholecystitis is a calcular etiology. The extrahepatic bile ducts are also well visualized in the ultrasound. And if there is a dilatation of a duct with a stone in the gallbladder, and a clinical history with lab investigations of obstructive jaundice, one can usually presume that there are stones in the duct, even if one doesn't visualize them. Remember that with the duodenal distension or small stones impacted in the retroduodenal or the intrapancreatic portion of the pancreas, it's very difficult for one to see the stone. Sometimes the stone would have passed also. Sludge in the retropancreatic or intrapancreatic or retroduodenal portion is also difficult to visualize. Periamporary tumors are difficult to diagnose on ultrasound, but for these it is safer to go in for a CT scan. Ultrasound is very helpful as far as evaluation of tumor invasion and flow in the portal vein, and this is an important guide in the resection of a periampillary or a pancreatic head tumor. A HIDA scan is one which is done with a technetium labeled derivative of dimethyl immunodiacetic acid. This is injected intravenously. It is taken up and then cleared by the cupfer cells of the liver and excreted in the bile. It is taken up in the bile within 10 minutes and it is excreted in the bile ducts, the gallbladder and the duodenum within 60 minutes of fasting subjects. It is a good tool for diagnosis of acute cholecystitis because the gallbladder is non-visualized in acute cholecystitis. And the sensitivity and specificity is 95% in the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. The other uses of HIDA scan are to check for an obstruction of the ampulla wherein there is a complete filling of the gallbladder in the CBD but delayed or absent filling of the duodenum. Biliary leaks which are a complication of gallbladder surgery can be confirmed and frequently even localized by the HIDA scan. As far as the imaging is concerned, CT scan and MRI are two of the investigations used in the diagnosis of gallbladder or extrahepatic biliary disease. CT scan is not very good for gallstones, but its application is mainly to check the extrahepatic biliary tree and the adjacent structures. It's excellent for malignancies, periampillary tumors, looking at the adjacent structures for staging information and also vascular involvement. As opposed to CT scan, MRI gives an excellent anatomical and functional detail of the liver, gallbladder, pancreas. It generates a very high resolution image and it is very sensitive and specific for detecting stones. MRI in combination with MRCP offers a non-invasive test for the diagnosis of biliary tract and pancreatic disease. In some centers, they first perform an MRCP and do ERCP only for those cases which need therapy. Two standard diagnostic and therapeutic procedures performed are ERCP and PTC. ERCP is usually done endoscopically, wherein there is a side viewing scope inserted as a usual OGD and then once it reaches the ampulla, the ampulla is cannulated usually with a sphincter, a sphincter otomy and the scope is passed all the way into the ducts. In addition to the ERCP, there is an additional scope which is called the intraductal endoscope. So one can actually visualize the CBD and the pancreatic duct. Stones can be taken off, sphincterotomies can be done 
and even lithotripsy can be done which can crush very large stones. PTC on the other hand is done mainly when ERCP is not possible and there is a malignant obstruction of the biliary tract. Under fluoroscopic uh, guidance, a small needle is inserted into the bile duct once it has been clearly visualized. There is an aspiration of bile and a dye is passed and the location is confirmed. The needle is kept in C2, a guide wire is passed, the needle is taken off and a catheter is passed over it. So this is called the Seldinger technique where one can railroad over the guide wire. Now through the catheter a choreangiogram is performed and therapeutic interventions are done such as biliary drainage or placement of stents. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you'd like to contribute any points or you'd like to edit them or you feel that something is amiss or should be updated, either leave your comments below or send me an email. Thanks again.